Not sure where all these cables are supposed to go, but. Amen. Amen. Well, good evening. Praise the Lord. I wasn't sure about standing here and being lined up all the time because I kind of move a little more like the wind does. So, wherever the Lord leads. But it's a joy of being here. Thank you all for coming. It's a blessing bringing the word. I've, um, the Lord is so amazing and he's been, I was like, you know, Lord, whatever, at home, you know, I have this, you know, this is what I would like to share and a number of things and, and, but I keep my heart open to the Lord and then last night I just, um, the Lord gave me a picture of what he wants me to share. And it's, you know, we have our own ideas, we've got our programs, our thoughts, but it's God, God is in charge. We just need to um, fully yield ourselves to him as the vessels in his hands. Amen. So I would, um, I'm just going to pray to you just for the spirit of the Lord to just settle into our hearts. I want to thank you all for coming too. It's a joy, a blessing to minister the word. And I also, I felt the Lord speaking to me before coming that there's a lot of hungry hearts here. God wants you to grow in his grace, in his truth. The things that the Lord gave me to share are steps of growth, steps of truth to bring us closer into his presence, into his truth, into his freedom, his liberty. Father, just thank you. Shelter and keep us by the blood of the Lamb. Father, let every inspiration take me to every scripture you want me to share. Father, I bless you. I thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. I thank you for your goodness. I worship you in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. So ton tonight, I've had this burden to, um, I want to clear up some things that, I've had questions after I was down here last time and in our church and I started preaching some of the things I'm sharing. I want to say some of the things I'm sharing are not being shared. You're not hearing them a lot from other places. I haven't heard some of these truths. I don't know that I've ever heard them preach some of the things the Lord is revealing to me. And I want to say, when some of these teachings are rare, it, I'm going to support these truths from Scripture, but it's about as rare as you'll see Pentecostal power. When you think about the Spirit of God coming down and moving as He's done at the days of Pentecost, as he did in, the, in 19, 1897, the turn of the century in Kansas City through a man named Charles Parham, where the Holy Spirit came down, and, and as the Holy Spirit came down, you know, they were speaking in tongues, they were delivered, set free, they were ministering and fasting unto the Lord. It came through deliverance, through prayer, crying out to God. It came through much intercession and prayer. The Holy Spirit doesn't just move somewhere it's it, the it says the lord is searching to and fro to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose hearts are perfect so god is always searching to pour out the power of the holy spirit and here and there hearts have seen it started seeking for it and god began moving but why are we not seeing more of a consistent flow of pentecost evan roberts in a welsh revival there were men so incredible under conviction, they were laying on the floor sometimes for two to three hours. And when they got up, they were changed. And they said in this trans vision, which is now slain in the spirit, a duplicate of it, but not the real thing because it's not accompanied with conviction and changed life. One of the things you'll see in every true revival is true repentance. If people are not turning from their sin, I don't care what you pray over them. You cannot patch up a dirty, filthy life. You need to be changed. Amen. And the way to be changed, Jesus says, go out into the world and preach repentance and remission of sins. You see a lot of Pentecostal movement, a lot of healing movements, a lot of power movements. If people aren't repenting, it's like a stick of dynamite. Poof, everybody's scattered and it's over. 
a lasting fire in a Christian is somebody that's been transformed because the Holy Ghost has gone to the very core of the heart and has changed the individual. And if there's no repentance, there is no end remission of sins. By the way, this word remission, go to the Greek, it's deliverance from sin. Repentance means turning around. Deliverance means to be saved from the power of it. You're not only repenting and turning around, but you're saved from the power of sin. And I'm going to be sharing on what God has done in my life in saving me from sin. And what He's done in, in remission, deliverance from sin. And I have prayed for a lot of individuals I've determined to help. And I noticed some are coming through, some are not coming through. Some are receiving grace, some are walking in anointed fire. One of the keys, there's many keys, blessed are they which hunger and thirst. They shall be filled. It's not just going to blow over you and hope it hits you. You have to be pressing into the kingdom. Jesus says it's just like a pearl that you sell everything and you pursue this pearl, everything you have, this pearl of great price. And that determination came into my heart maybe a couple years ago, but strongly as the spirit of lust was controlling my life. And I'm like, I, there's no way I as a Christian need to be living in that level of victory. And when I looked at the book of Acts and I looked at revivals and more and more reading revivals now, I'm realizing that these things are real. The power of the Holy Ghost is real. Amen. The Spirit of God that was put upon the disciples, first the twelve, where it says, I give you authority over devils and to cure diseases and over all the powers of the enemy. We are the sons of God with power. Now are we the sons of God and you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So we need to be walking as the sons of God with power. Do you understand that? So why are the sons of God not walking in power? And I begin crying out to God, what's the hindrance, Lord? And when I mean power, I'm talking about the healing graces of God. I'm talking about victory over sin. I'm talking about defeating the enemy. I'm talking about taking the kingdom to where it's never been before. What we've never seen. Hallelujah. And when it says you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me, unto Jesus. I used to think it's telling people that about Jesus. And it is. But it's so much more. It's becoming Him. The Bible says in 1 John 4, As He is, so are we in this world. So He makes us the sons of God with power. So why are Christians not walking in power? Why are they not walking in the reality of the gospel? And in all that it pertains and that God has for us, and I wanted this week just to focus on empowering the Christian. So I'm going to be sharing different truths and how to... And I need to preach on repentance because we need to go deeper. We, repentance is deeper than some people realize. The people that we have had a revival going on for quite a while, and I'm noticing, I've been sharing and ministering to some of our young people, the people that are keep repenting, keep crying out to God, keep seeking Him, God is cleaning their lives out. Cleaning. Cleaning. And their radiance, their glory, their joy is just being so beautiful. And this is not unique, but I wanna, I'm going to share some on deliverance again here today. But I want to lay a foundation from Scripture. People don't believe. I've had people calling me and telling me these things are not in the Bible. These things are not in Scripture. You just need to, you know, Jesus forgive your sins and you go to heaven. And, and those things are true. And they're operating on a down payment. When you get born again, you get quick and you get made alive. And that's the down payment of what's coming in the kingdom of God. It's just a small portion. The Bible calls it we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So when Jesus came back, and I think I shared that last time too. But when he came back to the disciples, he that confesses that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, it's been saved. That's being saved. 
That's not the work of sanctification. Sanctification of the Spirit is when the Holy Ghost starts taking everything out of your life that's in His way. Everything. So He can operate freely. And believe me, this did not happen to every believer in Acts. It did not happen. You can read when Paul was going back to Jerusalem. He took a vow upon himself and the elder said, go in and make a vow with them. We have four men here. And, it, and they said, there are thousands of Jews that are zealous yet for the law. That was long after Pentecost. Believers that were zealous for the law of Moses. Do you think they were walking in Pentecostal power? Absolutely not. They even influenced Peter. And Paul later had to rebuke him and say, Peter, he was being influenced by some of these Judaizers. And he wasn't, wasn't eating with the Gentiles when they arrived. And he told them in Galatians that, Peter, you're not walking uprightly here, according to And he corrected him. But what I'm saying is not all believers who go to heaven are free. Thousands of Jews were not free there. Walking in full Pentecostal power. It's walking all that God has for us. And you can go to, we might go later to Revelation and I'll show you some churches that had serious issues. Serious issues. Why? They were not walking in obedience. They weren't delivered. They weren't set free. If you'll turn with me to your Bibles to Job chapter 33. And <clears throat> God gave me a vision last night of what to share here. And something that's going on in my own heart. And some connections. So I want to I wanna lay a foundation. I want to say that when the Holy Spirit shall come, it's in Acts. And I also want to read it here in Job. But... I'm, I'm, why don't I start just with a short verse in Acts, and then I'll go back to Job. In Acts chapter 2, verse 16, and this is what's spoken of, of a Joel. It shall come to pass, unless I'll pour out my spirit on your sons and your daughters. They shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. This is a prophecy. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. How many of you is God speaking to you through visions and dreams? Raise your hand. A couple of you. It's real. You need to be thirsting after God. Go, go back to Job chapter 33. Let me read with you here some ways in how God operates. The Holy Spirit operates. And in Acts, you see it happening, but you don't have a teaching like this. In Acts, you see Peter in a trance receiving a vision. You see Ananias having a vision. You see different brothers having visions and direction being given. A man saying, go to Macedonia. So the Lord speaks. When everything is totally quiet, silent, not a noise, no distraction, no distractions, Look at what God does here. Go to uh, in, in Job 33. In verse 12. When somebody in the beginning of the chapter here. In verse 4 I'll start. The spirit of God has made me. The breath of the almighty has given me life. If thou canst then reset thy words in order before me. Stand up. Behold I am according to thy wish in God's stead. I am also fallen out of the clay. Behold, my terror shall not make thee afraid, neither shall my hand be heavy upon thee. Surely thou hast spoken in my heart, and I heard the voice of thy words, saying, I am clean without transgression. And Job was defending himself, and here one of his friends was speaking to him, but he's pre sharing some very solid truths here on how God operates. And that's what I want to come to. Behold, in verse 12, In thee thou art not just, I will answer thee that God is greater than man. Why dost thou strive against, for he giveth not a God account of any of his matters? For God speaks once, yea, twice, yet man perceives it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, in slumberings upon their bed, then he opens the ears of men and seals them their instructions. Everything is quiet. 
You're not busy with children that are crying. You're not out making money as a man. You're, you're just there, and everything is deadly silent. And in that deep, quiet, peaceful rest, the Spirit of God begins speaking. And you will find people that are in deep sin that they cannot sleep at night. They have such a difficulty falling asleep because the conscience, the heart, God has spoken during the day. He has spoken once. He's spoken twice. They're not listening. And the heart is just crying out. For attention. The uncleanness of the heart is crying out. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men in slumbers of our bed, he opens our ears that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keeps back his soul from the pit, his life from perishing by the sword. He is chastened with also a pain upon his bed and multitude of his bones with strong pain. So that his life abhorreth meat. And here he's, he gives a little bit of a picture on, on how God operates. Why? Verse further down. He looks upon men. If any man, if I sin and pervert that which is not right, it profit not. But why? That he may deliver his soul from the pit. His life from seeing light. He wants, to, he wants him to see light and see truth. All these things worketh God oftentimes with man. Or speaking to men to bring back his soul from the pit to be enlightened with the light of the living. God is trying to get attention. And, and I began crying out to God for revival in my life. And, and I'll, I'll share the vision in a little bit that he gave me last night. But um, I decided to go out and camp on, along the highway, along Missouri River. And I had, had a spirit of lust in my life. And I just sensed that there was more that God had for me. And things were not progressing the like way I felt like they should. And I just kept repenting. Anything God would show and bring my attention. And I was out there camping. And we're out there. only thing you hear is the, the soft waves. And, you know, I'm, the Lord is speaking to me. He's again showing me things in my heart, in my life. And, and I fall asleep in this state. And here it gives me a vision of a young lady that... And I want to share with you on how the enemy kind of comes in and how, and how deliverance works and how we need to be set free. Sometimes we don't even know it. So the Lord gives me this picture in a dream, a vision. And I, this, I've had this numerous times where this lady is in a dream and I want to marry her. And it's a certain lady. And, and it troubles me in this dream that why do I want to marry this lady here and, this is that, and I recognized her. And he showed me the family, he showed me the situation, he told, showed me the spirit that was still in me while I was sleeping. And it troubled me. I got up from the, my sleep and I'm like, Lord, what are you saying? What are you saying, Lord? And then he showed me as a young man, I had this picture of a certain girl in my tractor and was looking at it as often I could during the day, just lusting after this certain girl. And this girl came to my, this whole family. The, the Lord showed me what was going on, where I had opened my heart to that spirit of lust. The Bible says that look at the woman lust after I've committed adultery. And in this vision, I was committing adultery against my wife. And this woman was there, this girl. And I'm like, I woke up and I'm like, Lord, I've never seen this. Lord, I didn't know. Father, just... Wash it in the blood of Jesus. Lord, cleanse it away. Father, forgive me. I did wrong by a fair. Just sanctify me by the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you for giving me. And I just felt this. It's clean. It's clean. It's close. His door's close. This happened in a number of situations. God showed me every entrance, every time. As He showed me. He that committeth sin, committeth sin, committeth sin. He showed me the sins I'd committed so I could be forgiven, washed, cleansed, sanctified. Sanctification of the Spirit. Making your spirit holy. Making you holy as He is holy. And He cleans me out. And when I was done repenting over a process of a number of 
visions the Lord gave me, I was laying on my bed again, and the spirit of lust shows up, and it's laying next to me, and it's real. There's a demon there, a spirit there. And this thing, I'm wrestling with it, and I start praying in the spirit, praying in the Holy Ghost, and this thing is trying to hold on to my body. And I'm like, I was struggling. I'm like, Lord, what are you showing me? This thing has no power over me. I'm a born again believer. And I wake up and I'm like, and the Lord showed me, Junior, it's going to go out through the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit will push everything out of your life that he doesn't want in you. That day, I was out in a pasture praying all alone. And as I started praying in the Spirit, the Spirit of God just got stronger and stronger. All of a sudden, I started like, throwing up. And this thing came out of me and left. I had that experience on a number of times where different things came out of me and they were gone. And I felt the freedom now of the Holy Spirit just flowing. And, and the freedom like I've never felt before. But it's not possible if you don't repent. If you don't confess your sins. If you don't clean up your life. You can't pray things out of people without repentance. Without confessing your sins. Conf remission of sins is deliverance from sin, cleansing from sin. We have to repent. We have to cry out to God for forgiveness and cleansing. I used to have a lot of allergies in my life. And the same thing happened there. The Lord showed me. The last thing I repented of was anger towards my son, one of my children. I had a spirit of anger in my life. And it came in through compromises I made when I was about 30 years old. I went against some light, and I made a legion with somebody. Uh, I cannot go into a lot of details, but this individual affected me, and the spirit of anger came into my life, and I didn't see it. It started affecting my family. It started affecting my children, and then this child was born to me at that age, and this child I could not connect to it in my, my emotion, in my heart, and the Lord showed me it's that spirit of anger in your life in a vision. In a vision, the Lord showed me killing my own son again and again and again and again because the words hurt. They're like the speaking of a sword and they hurt. And you do emotional damage to your children. A spirit of anger literally kills the emotions in a child. And, and so God brought, I took my son, I went up in the morning and I just hugged him and just prayed for him and said, son, I'm so sorry. I'm just, please forgive me and wash Lord, just wash me in the blood of Jesus, hon. son, I love you. We have a beautiful relationship. God healed things up. And that was the last thing I repented of. And then I realized, I began realizing this. And it was the same time that I was, whenever I wanted to, I was trying to share a spiritual experience. I started sneezing. And I would say, stop in the name of Jesus. I realized there's a spirit behind it. And later... It, this was right at the same time, right after I'd repented of my sin. I was sharing spiritual truths, and this sneezing started. I'm like, there's something wrong here. And my spirit welled up again. I started praying in the spirit, and I literally sneezed and coughed and gagged, and this thing came out of my body, and my allergies left with it. And it was a spirit of anger. Look at somebody's face who's flushed with anger. It's, you can literally see it. These spirits have an effect on the body. They do. And, but God will reveal what He needs to deliver. So now I'm coming to some of the, what God showed me last night. We need to close doors. So God brought me to the place where I went back in my life and started closing doors. So that cleansing, washing. and So the enemy has no ground to operate in. It's like seed. He plants seed in the hearts. And as you yield to the seed, he can come in and start operating. So, I'll give you an example of how the enemy operates. And I'm asking the Lord, Father, give me wisdom and understanding so that I can understand and walk with you and the enemy cannot touch me. Protect me and my family. Lord, protect me by the blood of Jesus. So, about a year ago, I wrote a letter to the Dunkin' Donuts Corporation. I want to start Dunkin' Donuts restaurants in South Dakota, Sioux Falls, different places. God has given me some gift of leadership. And so the devil wants to use my leadership for making money. And so he's done that. I 
I got involved with a number of businesses, and through that, they influenced me negatively because I wasn't walking in the Spirit. So God gives us gifts to promote His kingdom and to see the kingdom of Christ expanding. And when the devil is leading us, it's just like he came to, to Jesus, you know. I'll give you the wealth of the world. I'll give you power. I'll give you, you know, recognition. That's what the devil does. So he wants to lead us into things like that. But anyway, I ran up writing this letter that I wanted to start some Dunkin' Donuts restaurants. And the devil knew it. That was about a year ago. And oh, the devil has a plan for my life. Here's I'm going to try to destroy Junior. The Lord has a plan for my life. But it's only through the Holy Spirit that that can be foiled. And so, the devil arranges that next to me on the plane down here, there's this guy sitting that owns 20 Dunkin' Donuts restaurants. And I'm going to try to get you in with Dunkin' Donuts so you can start these restaurants. And, you know, and he told me how much money they can make this and that. And, you know, my emotions start moving. You know, your heart. It's interesting. Yeah, I use it for God's kingdom, you know. You know what I thought of one of the first things the Lord brought to my attention is the life of Jesus. You want to become like Christ? Go do what He did. Be as He is. It's Christ. We're followers of Jesus. You don't have to compare yourself with some other businessman. Look at the life of Jesus. He's the perfect example. We're trying to be Christians. And Christians need to be like Jesus. Anyway, so here last night, my mind starts going in my heart on this business plan. And it's starting to consume me. And it's drawing me away from this revival that God wants to bring into your hearts. And I'm sensing it. And all of a sudden, after about 20 minutes, I'm like, you know what? This cannot be from God. And I started praying. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. For I shouldn't have done this. Lord, just cleanse you by the blood of Jesus. And the Lord brought me back into the Spirit. During the night, then I fell asleep. I mean, I left home and I left my mini barn doors open. And a whole bunch of mud was trying to get into this floor and making it dirty. And I go over there and I can't close the doors. And I look out and there's a lion outside prowling around. And I'm trying to close these doors and I can't. And I get fearful. God is getting my attention. I know these things are real already. I wake up. I'm like, Lord, what are you saying? He says, Junior, the devil's trying to get you. This whole thing with this business. You have an open door. A year ago, you wrote this email. And he knows it. And you yielded. You did not get... It was not my leading. I did not plant that seed into your heart. You were not being led by the Spirit of God when you wrote that email. You opened a door. The enemy wants to influence. He wants to start coming in and has a plan for your life. Repent. Lord, I'm sorry for watching. I'm sorry about writing this email. I'm sorry, Lord. And I'm not sure some of you were at Bible school and I shared a very similar story. I had a local guy offer me like a six-digit six income for a local job. And it was drawing me in. And I was very close to making some commitments. And the Spirit of God just did the same thing. It kept me from it. But what would happen if I wasn't in tune with the Lord? People just run and run. What happens when you start devising your own ideas, making your own plans, your own ambitions, your own ideas, your own, building your own world and your own little kingdom? I tell you what the devil does with you, exactly what he's got planned for you. And, and people don't realize that. What the devil does is he plants seeds. Go over to James. Well, it's also in, in Matthew 13. He talks about the sower went forth to sow. This stuff is real. The kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit, God puts His precious seed inside you. He wants it to grow. Don't you think for a minute the devil 
is not trying to produce after his kind because he is. I think I'm going to go to James first. And people have used these verses, try to say, you know, the devil's not involved, this and that. It's all from the human nature. Let me go to these scriptures here. Blessed is the man that endures temptation when he's tried. He shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt to any man. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own desires. So I have a desire in the flesh to be, say, make money, be a businessman, whatever. Those are the desires in my flesh. But they don't have to be in charge. You understand? Those are those natural desires. We all have natural desires to do this or that. That's part of the flesh. That's when you need to learn to crucify the flesh. It has no power over us. It's completely under the submission of the Spirit of God. We are no longer in the flesh but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. So when the Spirit of God comes in, He wants to start leading you. In all these things, okay, so the flesh here needs to be crucified. But the flesh is only the door. And the only one that can open that door is you from the inside. The Bible says, when we walk with the Lord, how does it say? He keepeth himself and the wicked one touches him not. There's a keeping that you're responsible to do. But here, listen to this. When lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. It's the same way with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit conceives in your heart, it brings forth holiness. You have your fruit, the Bible says in Romans, unto holiness and the end everlasting life. When sin conceives, who's the father? Who's the second one? Conception takes two. Who is conceiving what inside of you? And so, God, when you repent and you get delivered from sin, you're going back sometimes and destroying it from the root. You cannot have a root growing without a seed. You cannot have a root without conception. When there is conception, a root comes forth. John said, the Baptist, when the Holy Spirit shall come, he shall take the axe to the root of the tree. He's cutting out all that the power of the enemy has inside of you. Everything. What is missing in our day is a life that is seeking God with such intensity. There is absolute perfect cleansing and repentance and remission, deliverance from the power of sin. The devil doesn't care if you have weeks, six weeks of victory. He can go into hiding. It's where he's going to be a year from now, five years from now. When the Holy Ghost shows up, he goes into hiding. But the Spirit of God is going to show you the doors that he came in. And that's where you're responsible to cry out to God and to clean that ground so he has no place for the seed to grow. That you may have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In, in Peter, how do you know? How do you know there's things inside of you that shouldn't be in there? Turn to the next chapter. You no, know, to, to chapter 3. My brethren, have not many masters, knowing you should receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all, if any offend not in word. The same is a perfect man. This is the indication. This is one of the indications that your heart is actually free. That you have repented. That you've been cleansed. It's what comes out of you. 
what is conceived inside of you what's going on inside trust me when jesus walked along the streets life flowed out of him love flowed out of him god has created us i think this is going to be my message for tomorrow maybe but god has created us to become love and if anything but love is flowing out of your heart for sinner and saint alike something's wrong God has created you to become who he is, which is love. God is love. And he that dwelleth in God, dwelleth in love. And he in him and God in him. This is real. But look at this here. This is where some people, Christians, are living at. The tongue boasts, little member boasts great things. Behold how great a matter, a little fire king. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defiles the whole nature, set on fire the course of nature, set on fire of hell. There's Christians going around, gossiping, saying things about people, spreading evil, or hurtful words, anger, different things coming out. The tongue is one of the indications of a lack of freedom inside. Something is wrong. The tongue can no man tame. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father. Therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. What's coming out of you? What is God showing you? When you're all alone with Him, even in visions at night, even in dreams, what is coming out? What's in there? Ask God. If you're not walking in spiritual power, ask God what's in there that should be in there. Why? Because does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive trees? Olive berries, either a vine, fig, so no man, so no fountain can both yield salt, water, and fresh. Who is a wise man, dude, with knowledge among you? Let him show out of his good conversations, works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and striving in your heart, striving, bitterness, envying, relationships that are not working, from Man of God, every single relationship works. There's people that are going to hate you, and there's still going to be one thing flowing from your heart, that's love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us while we were yet sinners. You can love the unlovely. You can love those that speak against you. You can pour coals of fire on them when your own heart is free. But many, many people are not free. Don't lie to yourself. Don't lie against the truth. You know what's coming out of you at times. It's not of God. You know the thoughts. But sort of things are pure and lovely. Think of these things. Your mind, your heart. Is it full of God's thoughts? He meditates day and night. In Psalms 1, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of God, who stands away of sinners, but his meditation is upon the law of God day and night. And in his law does he meditate. The Word of God has become your meditation. The Word of God has become your identity. Jesus has become your identity. Your thoughts are fixed on Him. You love Him and you're becoming like Him as you're looking to Him and you're seeing Him in His glory and you just want more of Him and as you want more of Him, it's, He's making more of Him in you and then you want more of Him in you and then it just keeps flowing like a river and all of a sudden you're entering into a fountain of life that has no, no stopping. You're tapping into the glories of the kingdom. Hallelujah. 
It's so precious. But if you have wisdom, if you have bitterness or any envy, you're striving, a striving heart, striving relationships. This, is, it's, this wisdom doesn't come from God. God has made you, created you with a brand new heart and a brand new spirit I have put within you. And it says, I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. A new heart I will put within you and a new spirit. Has your spirit been made new? Are you allowing God to change you? If you don't, if you have any of these other things, it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where there's envying and strife, there's confusion, every evil work. But if God is truly filling your heart, the wisdom that's from above, you're going to be peaceful, peaceably. You're going to be gentle. You're going to be easy to be approached. One of the things the devil does tries to convince people that they are right and everybody else is wrong. You know, about and striving or striving about the law, striving around doctrine. I can't believe how Christians get so caught up in arguing doctrine. And the important thing is knowing Him. Since when are you going to go to heaven for believing the right doctrine? It doesn't say come into my kingdom. You have the right doctrine. It says come into my kingdom because I know you. You're my friend. Jesus told the Pharisees, search the scriptures. In them you think you're going to find eternal life, but you won't come to me. You have to come beyond the scriptures into a relationship where you're so consumed with His love that it's changing you. But it's through the avenue of repentance, allowing God to transform your life and taking everything out that He doesn't want in there. And trust me, God knows what He doesn't want in your life better than anybody else does. That's why we shouldn't go around and be quick to judge. Because we don't always know where the process of transformation is at. We may see things, but sometimes God is working in a different area. And people can only handle so much. The Father takes us through grades. Sometimes we're asking people to graduate from 10th grade on a doctrine where they haven't even passed first grade as a young believer. God is not going to ask people to do things that they don't understand, have no power to do, and have not come to light in. Allow the Spirit of God to transform people. He's well able. And if you, we are men of prayer, women of prayer, we can pray and God changes lives. But if somebody does come to you and asks you a question about what they see in their life, be free to share. But be also careful not to be taking the place of the Holy Spirit. It is possible. When we have a controlling spirit. God is able to clean the church right and well. And at the right time, he told Ananias, you have, a, you have light to the Holy Ghost. It was at the right time, right moment. And he fell out. There's times judgment's going to come. I could share some things, but it, information this time travels too fast. But I want to tell you this. I have prayed for situations and seen God laying His hand on situations where you can't get in there. When we are connected to God and you're actually in the will of God and your heart is right with God, you can move the powers of heaven. Let me give you an example of the power of God compared to man's. How long am I allowed to preach? <laughs> Amen. But in, um, I'll give you an example of how 
Okay, you've got armies that are set up against each other, fighting each other and all that. And, and Joash, I believe it was Joash, went to Elisha, the last Elisha, and Elijah and then Elisha. And he went to Elisha and he says, my father, my father, all of Israel. And he cries over him as he's laying there in his sickness. And Elisha is dying. He, there was a point of life where his life was over and he was dying and he was sick. And even though they threw bones in and they hit his bones and a man came back to life, the Holy Spirit didn't fully heal him and extend his life. And Elisha was dying. But before he died, King Joash knew the power of this one man. This one man was the protection of the country. One man. Can you imagine one man in America that hears from God and turns the tide of a whole battle? And when George is there, and he says, my father, my father, and he says, he told him, open the window and take an arrow and shoot out the window. And, he, and the prophet Elijah puts his hand on the king. And as the king is shooting out his arrow, one, two, and three, and then he stops. And the prophet Elijah takes his hand off and says, you should have kept going to five or six, and you would have totally consumed them. But now we are only going to defeat them three times. The power of one man of God laying a hand on the king in a sickly bed before he dies. More power than 100,000 men fighting in the front of a battlefield. Isn't that incredible? What we've reduced God to why? Somebody who's in touch with God has the authority of heaven behind them. And then we get involved and think, oh, God can't handle this situation. I have to go in and take care of this. Come on. Learn to pray. Learn to pray. I had forgotten my bag over at Johnny Troyer's, but I think Jake Gage was bringing it. But way over here, I'm like, you know what? I need a new, I need a clean shirt. I had a thinner, shorter T-shirt on. Anyway, and I'm like, you know, give, I'll give it to the Lord. I went by to Dollar General, and just as I drive up, there's this rack that I put outside a bunch of leftover junk. And here's this shirt hanging, my perfect shirt, okay? Just fits me, just what I'm looking for, my color and everything. And then it's for $2.50. And people don't realize who God is. He is so amazing. Absolutely amazing. I want to share another Oh, it's just precious. I need to share another story on healing. You know, we need to put our trust in the living God. God is real. And I was sharing the Lord healing of my allergies. My father has had Lyme's disease for years. He's been battling Lyme's disease. I know he doesn't care if I share this. But he was, he took antibiotics for I don't know how long. Then he tried Plexus. Then this new thing comes out, CBD oil, and he's pouring this all over him. And one day as he's reaching for the CBD oil, the Holy Spirit says, why don't you trust me? Just like, boom. He stopped. He said, Lord, you're right. You're right, Father. My dad is memorizing scripture. He'll stand up here, just quotes. He's 67 years old. He started memorizing scripture. But I'll tell him that a little bit later. But anyway, I walked into the house on, on Labor Day there, and he's sitting there just hurting. His hands are hurting. He says, Junior, this is what God's doing. Can you pray for me? We went and prayed, and the Spirit of God just flowed through there, and the pain just left, and it was healed. And it later tried coming back as he was working. He felt a little bit of stiffness. He's like, no, I'm not accepting this. God has healed me. He's given us authority, and his hands are fine. It's, it, it left. And there's actually grace and power of it but we need to trust god Amen. it doesn't just happen and my dad had the faith to be healed and god just raised a lady up in canada one of our brothers went up to canada and has a m mom up there his name is ivan richer and he went up and his mom has had for 10 years she's had alzheimer's dementia and then she fell, and I think she might have had a stroke, and she's just laying there in a coma on machines, just in very, very bad shape. And he was asked to come up. They want to shut the machines off, but they wanted to wait till he comes up there. And the doctor tells them, 
that there's no hope this is the end of dementia and of Alzheimer's. This is the last couple of days or a couple of hours. And he said, please don't do it till I get up there. And I, and I am convinced that some of these truths we've been preaching, I know it. The Lord has been breathing into his heart. And it's not me. It's the word of God. It's the truths of scripture. I want you to understand. I'm not taking, I'm not touching any of that. But anyway, he goes up there. And he takes the scripture, start reading, and the others left the room. And she hasn't talked in about 10 years. She can't function. She doesn't remember things. People's memory is gone. Anyway, and she's just laying there like this. And as he started praying, the Holy Spirit came down. Just precious flowing of the Holy Ghost. And she goes, hallelujah. He looks so like, what? And then she starts talking. I, I mean, you know, and a voice starts coming back, and in the doctor came in and is like, something is going on here. I've never seen it in my life. In three days, she was released from the hospital. On the weekend, she went camping. And I saw the before and after picture, and I just about asked for them. But the before picture is a little bit embarrassing. You've seen people laying in the hospital like this with, you know, tubes all over the place. It's incredible. God is real. But on the way up, he had a word of knowledge that God wanted to do this. These things are real. But with what Perez Reed had says it this way. He says we've been systematically educated to unbelief. It's the sin that is accepted in the church. You've been trained to believe what your eyes have seen instead of the eyes of the heart. There's two eyes. There's eyes in your heart where you see God. There's eyes in your head where you see what's going on around you. And what you see with your eyes is not the life of faith. In Hebrews, what does it say what faith is? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that you can see. And the opposite happens. So what we see with our eyes seems to have more influence than what we see with our hearts, which is what Scripture is, which is what Jesus, which is faith. And we need to be changed. How are we changed? We cry out to God until Jesus is formed in us and is living through us and working through us. God has gifts for the body. He takes captivity captive and gives gifts unto men. It's real. Amen. It's exciting. So I just want the Lord to keep working in our hearts and our lives. And Amen. I was thinking earlier, maybe we could just kneel and pray. If the Lord is showing you anything, or if you've if you're got a child or is unhandy, maybe you can just sit and pray. I want to have the Lord... Speak into your heart. In, in our Christian walk, it's step by step. We're moving closer to God, into His kingdom, into His life. Don't be content with anything less than what Jesus has for you. He has a plan for your life, a purpose. And the enemy has a purpose for your life. If you have wandered away, from your father's heart. Have you wandered away? Is your heart connected to a fountain that is flowing with life and grace and glory unspeakable? It's real. You don't have to live at a lesser standard than what Jesus said. He that believeth on him out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. You can live underneath a fountain of life. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Would you allow the Spirit of God to change you? Would you allow him to penetrate deep within and show him where the enemy may have come in and derailed you or pulled you into things you shouldn't be doing, shouldn't be seeing? Shouldn't be walking in. Maybe even businesses that need to be surrendered. Children that need to be have healing in the home that you have hurt.
but you hear his cry. I will also tell you this. The deeper the sin, the deeper the pain, sometimes to straighten those things out. It's not easy when you've been in deep sin to go back and clear those things right. Maybe you've ripped somebody off in a business dealing. A brother that you have hurt through a financial transaction, you know this brother is still hurting. Do you think for a minute the kingdom of God can come into your life without you clearing this mess up? That's not how it works. Zacchaeus was willing to go back and restore fourfold. And Jesus says, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. Would you repent? Would you ask the Lord, turn around, clear those things up? God loves you. He wants your life to be changed. Amen. Let's pray. You can either kneel or sit and pray. Father, I thank you that this is not my message, Lord. I have not come here to this church with my agenda, Lord. Father, I'm just your child. And I've come to believe in the simplicity of the scriptures. Because they're plain and clear. And I've come to realize that the majority of Christians are not living the life that you have for them. And Father, it's your will that we enter in to a life of holiness, a life of spiritual power, that we walk as sons of God with power. And I just pray, Spirit of the living God, would you descend on every heart and soul. And make the most important things that need to be changed important to them. I ask you that some will not be able to sleep tonight and are not willing to repent. Father, I'm asking this because it's your will, Father, that they deal and do business with you, Father. It's not your will that there's one hardened conscience in here. It's your will that the Spirit of God changes us, Lord. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Through sanctification of the spirit unto belief of the truth. I pray the truth would penetrate so deep here today that hearts and souls will become honest with you, God, with what's going on inside and what's going on in their homes, Lord, or in a marriage, Father. I'm asking you for the sanctification of the Holy Spirit that men and women can walk in a sanctified and a holy life full of the grace of God. Jesus, I'm inviting you in the name of Jesus and I command you, and every deceiving spirit is not to work. You are defeated. Lord, I just pray, have your own will and way in every heart and soul. In Jesus' name, for you're the King of glory and we trust you, Father, because your life, your strength, God, you're everything we need, and we love you. I'm committing this word to you, Father, and I thank you for everyone that is here, Lord. Father, just pray that you will keep changing us, Father, and keep bringing us the word of life. In Jesus' name, amen.